everybody. Okay. Well, now we are live. Are we live? Yes. Okay. So I say a few words in, in English to welcome Dr. Pierre George Rigetti, which happens to be not an exceptional scientist, but a very dear friend of Brazil. And I speak by myself, a very dear young friend, young scientist that I have the pleasure to share uh, part of my life, not as much as I wanted, but uh, those were happy, very happy and inspiring moments where, when we were together. Regat, I, I apologize, but I say a few words in Portuguese, okay? Then we'll come back to English. Yes. Uh, Bem-vindo todos, dou as boas-vindas a todos e todas agora, tem que ser todos e todas para ser politicamente correto, mas eu queria imediatamente agradecer a todos vocês, que vou falar rapidamente, agradecer a todos vocês por terem se inscrito e participado. Nós temos mais de 200 inscritos, é um número extraordinário, que quer dizer que o evangelho proteóbico realmente está sendo espalhado pelo país. E eu queria agradecer especialmente ao Tiago, que é inspirador desse My Friends Massa, ao Giuseppe, ao Fábio, ao Magno, aos meninos, o Luiz Felipe, a Ana Carolina e, 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 e a Jéssica, por terem organizado tudo isso, participado disso tudo. A BR Pro se juntou e temos também o, o apoio da Nova Analística, que financia parte dos gastos desses seminários. É, muitos outros seminários virão o, o, o Tiago vai apresentar a lista de seminários Fazer alguns comentários sobre isso Mas eu queria agradecer novamente Ao Dr. Pierre Jorge Arriguete Em português agora Pela presença e pela honra que ele nos dá Abrindo esse seminário O José vai falar mais sobre ele Eu termino aqui minhas palavras Dando renovando as boas-vindas e passando a palavra ao Tiago para alguns comentários. Depois, Tiago passará a palavra ao Giuseppe para a apresentação, então, do, do nosso palestrante de hoje. Tiago, é com você. Obrigado a todos e a tudo, por tudo. É, eu que agradeço, José, é, professor Gilberto. É, eu estou só com um problema para mostrar aqui o que eu queria. Take this out. Um, ok, now I have. So, uh, I, eu vou falar agora rapidinho em inglês, pessoal, depois eu, eu volto para o português. So, uh, Professor Rigetti, and, and glad. Today we are starting the second uh, webinar uh, of proteomics. And this is a, a, a webinar series that's organized by the Proteomics Society of Brazil which is uh, Professor uh, Gilberto is the president. So today we have the honor to have Professor Rigetti talking for us a little bit. Then we'll have uh, next uh, Thursday, uh, the Professor Susan Wang Trout. She's going to talk about uh, DIA data, so data independent acquisition. Then on the 15th, uh, Professor Jennifer we are, is going to talk about proteomics and how it can work to help us in personalized medicine. I think it will be also a very interesting talk. Then a Brazilian professor from the University of Brasilia is going to talk about uh, ischemic cardiac reconditioning and how it can help in myocardial disease, for instance. It's, I, 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 I skip it here. This is going to be a very important uh, section that's the students, Professor Rigetti. We, they, they submit uh, manuscripts, and then some are going to be selected to present. So I think it's a, it's a very inspiring uh, date. It will be on the 20, 22nd one, and then the other one on the 6th of July. Then Professor Solange Serrano is going to talk about uh, venom proteins and how post-translation modifications can uh, modulate their function. And then finally, the next talk of this second webinar series will be Professor John Yates, and he's going to talk about single-cell proteomics. So I think it's, we have a, a really broad 
uh, program here. It's uh, we are somehow have a little bit of anything that are hot topics in the moment for uh, proteomics. So you are very welcome to to attend all these meetings. And that's it. So uh, I just want to say something in Portuguese. Just a moment, please. É, então, para o pessoal, só lembrando que é, quem fez a inscrição no evento tem que fazer, assinar a lista de presença todos os dias que vão ser disponibilizadas no chat. É, não esqueçam de fazer isso, porque elas vão ficar disponíveis só quando o evento estiver online. É, vocês podem, então, vocês também, por favor, é, não esqueçam de, fazer, de assinar, né? Lembrando também que é, até, o, até o final do dia, hoje, está aberta a inscrição para os resumos, então não deixem de fazer essa inscrição, acho que vai ser bem legal. É, o, melhor, o melhor apresentação vai, ter, vai receber um prêmio, vão ter outros é, prêmios sendo distribuídos, então não percam essa oportunidade. Com relação à inscrição, só lembrando, pessoal, que vocês têm, para ter o certificado no final do evento, vocês precisam ter, é, participar de pelo menos 80% dos seminários, tá? Eu acho que dá em torno de seis webinars. É, então, não, 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 não deixem de, de assinar, tá bom? A lista. Qualquer dúvida, manda para a gente aqui no chat também. Eu vou parar de falar, porque agora o dia é sobre o professor Rigetti e o Giuseppe vai apresentá-lo. So, Giuseppe, please, é, introduce this lovely guy for us. Your microphone. Obrigado, Thiago. É um bom dia a todos. I will switch now to English. Uh, so it's a, a great honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Pier Giorgio Righetti. Uh, normally, you have a great honor where when you have already a great scientist. In this case, my my pleasure it's even more because I have been admiring Professor Rigetti since when I was a PhD student. And I remember in uh, early 2000, I was in a conference at the Italian Proteomic Association in Viterbo. I don't know if Professor Rigetti remembers. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, at the time I had a small poster to present and uh, on uh, mitochondrial complexes and phosphorylation. And I was using blue native page at that time to separate these complexes. And uh, during the poster session, I had the pleasure to, to have Professor Riget and comment some of the work. And it was, uh, it was really great from that time. And since then I've been following for, uh, for all of this year. So uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce him. I would like to give uh, a little bit of introduction of the career of Professor Rigetti. So Professor Rigetti is uh, currently a emeritus professor at the Milan's Polytechnic. He earned his PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Pavia in 1965. And then he spent three years as a postdoc at MIT and one year at Harvard. He has developed along this year uh, several methods, several techniques in protein chemistry, starting from isoelectrofocusing in immobilized pH gradients, membrane trapped enzyme reactors, combinatorial peptide ligand libraries, which have completely changed the way we analyze low abundant protein. And uh, recently, a few years ago, he developed together with GLEB, the EVA technique for exploration of the cultural heritage. And this will be the main topic of his presentation today. He's a, a world leading a scientist in the field. And uh, we can see that from the 560 articles that he has published so far, with an H index of 75, which is really impressive. Besides papers, he has also contributed to several books uh, like the Proteome Revisited, Theory and Practice of the Relevant Electrophoretic Steps in 2001, which was uh, very important for me when I started reading this book. 
And uh, beside that, he has also won several awards, like the California Separation Science Society Award. And in 2011, he was nominated honorary member of the Spanish Proteomic Society and won also the one year later, the prestigious Beckham Awards and medal granted in February for the Geneva MSB meeting. So uh, I really think that when you, everyone needs to read articles from Professor Rigetti because you can see the way, the style they have written. You can see that it's very unique. You will find very few articles written in this way. And uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm sure about what I'm saying now that when you find a scientist that has knowledge in art, culture in general, music and so on, I mean, this is uh, something that is like a diamond in, in our field. And uh, I hope we, we have more of the scientists in, uh, to share our knowledge. So I could stay here and talk uh, more half an hour, one hour to, to say everything that Professor Rigetti has done during his life. Uh, however, for the interest of time and also for the interest of the uh, students and everyone, colleagues that are watching at this time on YouTube, I would leave the stage to Professor Rigetti. So Professor Rigetti, it's a great honor to be here today to introduce you. So now the stage is yours. So if you can share your presentation and uh, start your lecture. Well, thanks a lot, Giuseppe. And uh, good morning, Brazil. <laughs> I, I'm very, very happy to present this talk and I would like to thank you, Giuseppe and Gilbert and Solange for inviting me and all the other uh, people in Brazil who organized this meeting. Now, before actually starting the presentation, I would like to, to recall an episode of my last visit to Brazil when I, when I met uh, Gilberto and Solange. It must have been 10 years ago or something like that. One evening, they invited me to a small restaurant in the beach of Ipanema, and we were sitting by the same window in which in 1962, Vinicius de Moraes and Carlos Jobim found the saw the very famous girl from Ipanema walking by, and then they they wrote this famous uh, uh, song that is extremely popular. Now we sat there all the night, but there was no girl from Ipanema showing up. So that means Gilberto, you will have to invite me again. Give me a second chance. <laughs> for, for, first of all, and then up before starting it. I want to thank Giuseppe for reminding me the story of the meeting in Viterbo. This was a series of meetings, very, very successful, organized by Professor Zola in Viterbo. Now, let me tell you something that probably not, not so many of you know. Viterbo is very close to Rome. And in the Middle Ages, I've forgotten uh, which time, maybe uh, around 1,200 or so on, there was a very important conclave for electing a new pope. Now, the cardinals were sitting there in a magnificent place, eating food that the population of Viterbo had to provide, drinking wine and so on, but do, they would never deliver. They spent there several months, you know, exhausting the resources of the poor villages of the town of Viterbo, and they would never, you know, the, the Holy Spirit never visited them, and they could not decide which pope they would elect. Finally, the people were so upset that they locked them in, they stopped giving them food, and then they, they destroyed the roof so that it started snowing inside. Immediately, they elected the Pope. So, after this story, I want to start my presentation and present this, and now I'm telling to you people that, I'm sorry, I will not give so much proteomics. In this presentation, there will be a lot of some proteomics, but there will also be a lot of history, literature, poetry, and so on. So please excuse me for that. So you will see the title here, New Base for Fishing in the Cultural Heritage, Mare Manium. So which are these new base? Is this what is called the EVA Film Technology? 
EVA is an acronym, and it stays for ethylene vinyl acetate film. So it's a plastic film, but it started with strong cation and nano exchanger as well with some hydrophobic resins, mostly C8 and C18. This film, of which you see here, a skin, when you, when, when you place it onto any surface that can be a page of a famous writer, a painting, anything, any, any uh, support material, will capture what is in the surface. What has been captured will then be eluted, and then we will go to, for instance, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, and we will identify whatever material was captured on the surface. So, how do we do it? Here it is the EVA film. We put in evidence a strong cation and strong analysis changes. And here is, down here is a, a page of a very famous writer. It's a page of the famous novel by Bulgakov, Master in Margarita, that we explored. It was the very first document that we explored. Suppose that there are proteins on the surface left by the finger, by, by the author touching the surface. You know, when we touch anything, we always leave keratins, we, we leave saliva proteins, anything on the surface. And that's what we capture. So proteins which have an excess of negative charges will be captured by the positive charges on the film, etc. So how does it work then? Here, you see on the left here, in, uh, uh, close to the numbers one, two, three, this is the actual representation of these plastic films, you know, these diskettes of EVA. And so this now has captured something. So how do we elute it? There are three ways. We can digest it in situ, the proteins with trypsin, and then elute, elute the peptides and then go to a mass spectrometry. Or, we can elute the protein intact, do, do SDS page, as you can see here in the middle, cut out any single protein, so bend excision, digestion, and then again mass spectrometry, or we can elute the trips in digestion and then go to uh, mass spectrometry. Here you see a review that we published very, very recently in Journal of Proton Research uh, just a few months ago, and you can read all the story there. Now let us start with the first example. This is, uh, on the left, you can see a picture, a photograph of uh, uh, Bulgakov, Mikhail Bulgakov. And in, on the right side is the cover of Master Margarita, the Italian edition. Now, uh, Bulgakov, between 1936 and 1940, he was, re he was revising his masterpiece that he had burned totally, he had burned the manuscript in 1930, and then he, he wrote it again. And then between 36 and 40, he was correcting it over and over again. Now, his novel didn't see light because Stalin, uh, you know, uh, Stalin sequestered and it was published only much later after his death in 1967. Now, during these four years, 1936 and 1940, he, he was revising his text, but he was suffering. We knew he was suffering from an ephritic syndrome that took him to his grave. So we said, you know, remember, uh, he was a physician. He graduated as a physician. And in 1918, Lenin sent him to fight, you know, during the October Revolution and, and cure soldier, wounded soldiers. So we said, if he was suffering so much, could he have taken morphine? Because, you know, he was a physician, he had access to it. So we, we took uh, imprints from the margin of his original manuscript, we eluded it, and sure enough, as you can see from GCMS, look at this peak around seven minutes, this is morphine. In the inset, you can see the standard, pure standard of morphine, you see the peak inside, but not only morphine, we can see also uh, when we uh, ingest morphine, we also metabolize it to 6 or acetyl morphine, and there it is, this peak, this protein. So we knew that there was morphine in there, but there is more to it. Gleb Silberstein devised a special method for mapping it in situ, the morphine. And if you can see these two pages of the original manuscript, you see the many corrections that he did in the text and so on. Look here in the left, this dark grayish uh, area. He mapped it for the presence in situ of morphine 
and down here below you can see not so much his fingerprint is thumbprint thumbprint mapped by the different levels of morphine you see of course the levels of morphines are lower levels in the periphery so the green is two nanograms as you can go toward the center is five nanograms and ten so this is a spectacular way of taking a, a, a thumbprint and i think that even sherlock holmes would have been very envious of our of our uh, technique now as luck goes when we published this paper we were strongly attacked by aspect of, uh, of, of Bulgakov. Uh, sorry Uh, because they said that it was not reported anywhere that he was an expert in uh, that he ever took morphine and so they said ah this fingerprints must have been not from him but from um, uh, from maybe the secret agents uh, you know of Stalin. so we went back and this time we we uh, we searched for proteins we alluded them you know possibly proteins from saliva we looked at them and among the proteins identified, we found out three biomarkers of the Bulgakov renal pathology, which are precisely n glucosaminidase periostin, and nephrin. So it is clear that these fingerprints were not from the secret agents of Stalin, but were from genuine, uh, from Bulgakov, because one cannot pretend that all the KGB agents suffer from the same pathology. So this was the second part paper we published in 2017. Next, of course, by staying in Russia, you cannot talk about Bulgakov without thinking of Anton Chekhov, who is the most famous playwright in this epoch and, of course, up to today. Now, Anton Chekhov is buried in the Novodevichy Cemetery in the periphery of Moscow. And you see here, this is very famous, uh, this is very cute. Look at the right side of this panel. You can see a young, <laughs> very young Sophia Loren visiting the tomb of uh, uh, Anton Chekhov in this cemetery. Now, uh, this was probably around 1960, 1962. In those days, nobody could travel to Russia and to Moscow. So how did she go there? Possibly. She was sent there by the Italian Communist Party, that was the strongest Communist Party outside of, of Russia. And she was, you know, they told her, please go to see the grave of Anton Chekhov and make sure that somebody takes a picture of you so they will realize that you are an intellectual person, which uh, I, I'm not so sure about. So, uh, about 60, 70 kilometers outside of uh, Moscow, there is a a, a dacha of Anton Chekhov, which is now a, a museum in a town called Melikovo. We went there to this museum. We searched into his letters and so on to find out if he, you know, he died of uh, tuberculosis. So we, we looked for traces of the cock bacterium, but we could find none in his streets. However, the here, as you can see on the left side, here is the, the shirt which he was wearing the very night in which he died. Uh, down here you can see A, C, Anton Chekhov in Cyrillic characters, uh, you know, that show that it belonged to him. Now, as luck goes, the wife, when he died, took this, uh, uh, this shirt. She never washed it and uh, some 20, 30 years afterwards, she gave it to the museum. So we put, you see this red dot here, we put uh, the, the ever this cat on the collar, and as we alluded it, look, we detected the mycobacterium tuberculosis on check of short collar by removing, you know, we did a, a very extensive proteomic analysis, what is called the metaproteomic approach. We put in all the patterns we had, we had, uh, we had identified. We could exclude the various mycobacterium africanum, bovis, etc. And finally, mycobacterium tuberculosis, we found a few proteins, in particular this one, this 8 amino 7 oxo nonano 8 synthase, which is very, very typical of the mycobacterium tuberculosis of you. So we could confirm that. And that was quite extraordinary finding this bacterium 
in a short, you know, some 120 years after his death. Now, but perhaps the, 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 the paper we published that, that really had the resonance the world over is the paper that we published on a bout of, uh, of a plague that uh, occurred in 1630 between May and November in Milano and Lombardy region. It claimed about 200,000 victims, but it could have gone uh, uh, unnoticed were it not that in 1850, uh, Alessandro Manzoni wrote a famous novel called The, the Betrothed, and in his famous novel, he had the two chapters describing the conditions in the Lazaretto. Now, the Lazaretto in Milano was a huge, huge structure. You know? <laughs> it was 275 times 275 meters, an enormous structure which at the peak of the plague could host up to 10 to 12,000 people inside the earth. Tremendous. But now there is nothing left. The, you know, unfortunately, the Milanese destroyed everything. The capitalist society was very aggressive and we only have these five rooms left of. And so in any event, what we did, we knew that the that registries of this event of uh, the plague in Milano were stored in the state archives in Milano, in Via Senato. This is the entrance of the state archives. Now, this is a, a fantastic structure built around 1600 by San Carlo Borromeo. It was a, a, a seminar for Jesuits, you know, for students of Jesuits. And now it has the uh, state archives, which are open to the public. So if you are ever in Milano, please visit it. It's a magnificent, magnificent structure. So when there, we, we analyzed, there were only, there must have been maybe a few hundred of these uh, books, you know, of these death registers, but there are only seven or eight surviving. We screened many, many pages, you know. I spent a few weeks there studying and asking the archivist to explain to me the mysteries of these pages. Here you see a page. This page is from uh, the uh, death registry of the 9th of September 1630, when the plague was still raging and was still in full activity. Now, as you look at it, and I, I, I do not know, as you can see, there is, how could they uh, organize? How could you know the people, where they were living in the town, they were, they, you know, they were, uh, um, they were stored under the archives of the of the churches in which they were living. So here, here it says the Church of Santo Stefani Forest, uh, Saint Etienne. Oh, sorry. And here is uh, San Bartolomeus, the Church of Saint Peter, Saint Son, the Church of Saint Lazarus. And then comes the name of the fellow who died, the reason why he died. A lot of them, you know, for a lot of them, it is written in, in Latin, ex peste obit, he died of plague. And then there is the name of the physician who issued the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the reference. And the physicians, this is very funny, is not a real physician. These are barbers, you know, is in Latin, is barbitonsors. And, you know, in, in those days, the barbers were also acting as physicians. Remember in the Far West, you know, this legendary Far West, the movies, the barbers were uh, the substitute of physicians. So now, this is one of the pages. And here is one of the diskettes that we applied, but we applied many, many diskettes to 11 pages and so on. And then we looked at them. And wow, look at that. The Yersinia pestis identified via metaproteomic approach. We identified 22 unique proteins pertaining to your senior pestis. So the signals were still there, very, very abundant signals. You see, that's the way we did the metaproteomic approach. And that finally, as we got there to your senior pestis and all the specific peptides for these 22 proteins. This was really an enormous success. When we published this paper, there were you know, it went into TV talks, internet size, newspapers all over the world. Amazing. Even Brazilian newspapers, by the way. Now, if we had not found the Yersinia pestis, it would have been a disaster. But we found much more. 
We identified more than 600 proteins. So we identified, for instance, which food were the poor uh, scribes eating. And they, you know, it was extreme poverty. They were eating no, no meal, of course, no, 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 no meat. They were eating some vegetables and so on. But we also identified another, this is very important, this table, because for the first time in the world, we identified a second cause of death. Not all people who died of plague were, were died from the bubonic plague. Two, about 2% two of the population died of anthrax disease. This this famous anthrax that we have heard recently, you know, that they were sending this black powder to the senators in USA. You know? and, and how could we, uh, could we state that? Because it, historically, these books, you know, the death registries registered about 2% of the population. They said there were no signs of bubos and of plague, but these people died of very high fever. And that's what happens if you in, inhale anthrax and you are very weak and your immune, immune response is very weak, they will go to, to your lungs, they will generate very, very high fever and within 48 hours you will die. So that's the second cause, the small but important that we have found. Then we went to Paris to read the Casanova Memoirs at the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris. And, you know, this is very interesting. This is a, a picture, you know, a graphic drawing of uh, Casanova. Casanova wrote in his famous memoirs that he had several bouts of gonorrhea, the first episode occurring when he was only 12 years of age. So we visited this manuscript, kept, uh, you know, religiously in this uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in Rue de Chalieu, we had to knock at the door for one year before they granted us access for just one hour, you know, take or leave it. But yeah. finally, we published this paper in uh, Letter for Ages in 2019, and I gave it to it a very cute title, which is the title of a very famous uh, song by a French singer. Il n'y a pas d'amour heureux pour Casanova. You know, Casanova didn't have happy love affairs just like everyone else in her, you know. So you, you might want to, to listen to this song, which is beautiful. So uh, let me show you. This is the frontispiece of the Histoire de ma vie, you know, uh, written uh, by him, you know. Here he says, écrit par lui-même, you know, written by, by myself. And he calls himself uh, Chevalier de saint which is uh, an honorific title that he has given to him. No, and he wrote it in a, in a castle in Bohem, called in a, in a village called the Du. In the, uh, and here it is, the chapitre one, the first chapter. So this is really magic for me. You know, I knelt down. It was like reading a Bible. You know? I was really impressed. This is one of the pages we screened. You see here on the left. You see this elongated, darker strips. These are, uh, you know, the Eva strips. Uh, and then we put small pieces around the text and so on. And we are, uh, you know, we are looted and arrested. And we try to find out the traces of the gonococcus, but nothing to be detected. Then we talked to the physicians and they said, well, you, you were foolish. You cannot think of finding the gonococcus on a, on a piece of, uh, on a page, when even in vivo, finding the gonococcus on a patient who has this disease is extremely difficult. You have to have monoclonal antibodies, you have to do fluorescent detection, it's in the difference. So, no way we could do it, but however, we could have indirect evidence for it because we found some red, minute red dots around the streets. And uh, Gleb Zilberstein developed a, a special sensor for mercury. And with this sensor of mercury, by screening the surface with this sensor, we found out in between. The writing you see here in between this written text, we found out the levels of mercury. Again, the green is very low levels, the yellow is higher levels, the red is top levels, you know, 0 0.04 milligram per kilo of, of, of paper. And now these levels are, can only be due to the fact that he was assuming what? He was probably taking uh, mercury sulfide, 
Now, Mercury should fight, as you know, in, in the Middle Ages and even today, it's called the cinnabar. Cinnabar is a, is a strongly red dye that in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, painters used to paint to the mantles of the Madonna of the saints and so on. But what happened? In 1493, when uh, Columbus uh, sailors came back from America, they had syphilis, they had horrendous uh, uh, boobos and so on, and people thought that they, were, they had applied, instead they had taken syphilis. And in those days, they used cinnabar to cure syphilis, and they gave, you know, 10 grams uh, orally to the, to the poor sailors, so they were cured by, uh, by the syphilis, and they all died, because this is tremendously poisonous. So, but then later on during the centuries, it was used as a, you know, uh, to, to, to put uh, on the surface, you know, on, on your scars on the skin. And that's what probably has an overview. So here is the evidence, indirect evidence that you have. Then we went back to, uh, we went back to Russia in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, there is, uh, you know, in, in the National Archives there, there is a tremendous collection of Kepler's manuscripts, thousands and thousands of pages. Now, we were wondering if whether Kepler had also been playing, uh, you know, as a, uh, had been doing, uh, a, he was an alchemist, because in those days, plenty of astronomers also played around secretly on alchemy. So we said, could Kepler have, have, uh, have uh, worked on alchemy? Uh, in 1600, he, he was called in, um, uh, in, in the capital of the Czech Republic in Prague by the emperor. And maybe, we said, maybe he worked on that. So in order to find out if he, if he, if he did uh, alchemy, we had to prepare new disquettes. And these disquettes now contain uh, chelating agents for capturing metals, potential metals on the surface of this uh, script. And among them, you can see, uh, for instance, CDTA, you know, ethylene diamino tetracytic acid. So we use three different uh, chelating agents. And here is a sample of a page, but we screened 20 pages, you know. Uh, and you, you see here, in, in this particular case, he was writing a book uh, uh, dedicated to Hipparchus, that was a very famous Greek astronomer, but in reality, it was a book about the moon movements. You can see these drawings, the moon, the eclipses of the moon, and so on. So we put these sketches around these very, very many pages. We eluded them, and then we analyzed the elevate by the inductively coupled plasma analyzer mass spectrometry. And here you see the spectrum, and as you can see, you see uh, AS arsenic, AG, silver, aurum, so gold, mercury, and lead. The five classical methods that were used by alchemists since the Middle Ages. We published this in a very famous journal called the Talanta in 2019. Now, when we published that, there was a riot because a lot of people wrote and said, it is impossible. Nowhere it has been written that Kepler ever played around. There are no historical records that Kepler played around with alchemy. Uh, well, of course, it is true. I mean, you know, in those days, I'm talking about 1600, he was working in Prague. That was still in the sacred Roman Empire, you know, the capital of the sacred Roman Empire. Imagine if he had openly stated that he, he, he was doing alchemy. He could have been burned uh, at a stake by the church, you know, it was strictly forbidden. So, of course, if he ever did it, he kept very, very secret. Uh, so, but the evidence is there. You cannot have these five meters unless you have contaminated them in the surface of your paper, because in the clean paper, that we, there, is, there are no traces of these five meters. Now we go to the very famous and very sad story of the Spanish Civil War between 1936 and 1939, uh, that, you know, split the town, uh, split poor Spain into two. Uh, you know, in those days, in 1936, uh, the leftist front had, had won, and so there was a leftist government. Imagine, 
the church called the Franco, Francisco Franco, the general, who was down in Morocco, you know, because they had an enclave in Morocco that they still have today, and he was there with his troop. And unfortunately, it was Mussolini who gave a lot, to spend a lot of fortune helping the Moroccan troops of Franco to, to embark and disembark in Spain. And so, unfortunately, the Spanish Civil War was won by the fascists thanks to Mussolini, who spent a fortune to have them win. And George Orwell was there as a fighter in the international brigades, and then he was wounded, and then he, he, he went back home in, in July 1937. In the 1938, he immediately published this very, very famous book, Homage to Catalonia, that I encourage you to read. The stories are in three. Now, what happened is that, as I told you, he was wounded on the front, in the Aragon front. He was wounded uh, on the neck, and he risked his life. And then he was transferred to Barcelona. He was transferred to Barcelona, uh, and unfortunately, in the hospital, he was infected too by, uh, you know, by cock by, by bacillus. So he had tuberculosis. So then he rushed back in July, he rushed back home because, uh, you know, the secret police wanted, uh, you know, he was uh, he was fighting in, in a company called the Poem. The Poem was uh, uh, at the Trotskyist uh, as members and Stalin wanted to obliterate all of them. So Stalin had ordered to exterminate all these people. So he had to rush back home. And as he got there, you see, in the 2nd of July, 1937, he wrote this letter to a friend, uh, Sergei Dynamov, who was the editor of foreign literature. Now, he had sent uh, to him uh, uh, a copy of his book, The Road to Wigan Pier, to be translated in Russian. So he wrote to him uh, this very honest letter telling him, look, be careful, because I was in the Palm Militia, in, you know, in the International Brigades, and if you publish my book, you could have lots of problems with that. Now, what is unique of the, about this letter is that this letter is typewritten, it's not even handwritten. Nevertheless, we put these diskettes here, we put two diskettes up here in the top corners, we put a diskette of Eva here, um, on, on the surface of his signature, and we put two diskettes down here that you cannot see at the bottom of the page. And sure enough, can you believe it? We found the traces of the of, of, of the cock bacterium in one, two, and three. That is in the two upper corners and in the signature. But we didn't find them in the two lower corners. And that figures, by the way, this is the mycobacterium tuberculosis on the letter surface. Why did we found them in these places? Because when you remove a foil from a, a typewriter, you touch with your fingers the two upper corners, then he signed it, but he didn't touch the two lower corners that were the negative contacts. And here it is. We found this isocitrate lyase with these patterns that are very specific of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is the paper we published in uh, just last year, 2020, and this is almost, uh, I repeat, it's almost like a magic thing because it was done on a type written that, so that's very unique, <laughs> written in 1937. So, you know, again, 80 years old, stored in, a, in Moscow in a, in a house of a special country. Now, now uh, I want to show you this funny story about Stalin funerals, you know, finally Stalin, uh, you know, Stalin in a way was like Hitler, he was a tremendous dictator too. And he died, uh, and then they had a funeral the night of March 1953. But in reality, he had a stroke, and he was very sick for six days. So they called, uh, you know, the, the, the members of the Politburo who let him there for six days to die slowly without calling the without calling the physicians and so on, because they were fighting to be the successor. This is funny. Then when he died, there was a tremendous funeral in Moscow. You know, one million people went to the funeral because you know he was called the little father, 
you know, uh, Russian people uh, called him the little father. Why little father? Little because he was very small, you know. Yeah, he was only 1.63 meters tall. And father, because he sent his, uh, you know, the Russian people in vacation in the gulags. So he was like a good father. And he had millions and millions of people dying in the gulags. So he was a really good father. So, in any event, let me show you this five-pointed star on the top of the candle. Here were the six, per, uh, uh, six person looking for, you know, uh, to be a successor. The one in the top here with the glasses, uh, with this funny face, is Lorenzi Beria. Then here we see Khrushchev on the left. There we see Kaganovic, Bulganin, Mikoyanov, Malenkov, and there was even uh, Molotov, the very famous one of the Molotov one, but Molotov said, don't call me, I want to be outside, there. I don't want to be there. Now, if Beria had been elected, Beria was even worse than Stalin. Beria was the, the head of the KGB, he had one million agents of the KGB, one million, you know, uh, at his feet, so he, he had, if he had been elected, then at the beginning he won the first round, but then Nikita Khrushchev managed to overthrow him. Uh, you know, they took him in prison and they executed him immediately. And Khrushchev uh, came to power. Uh, and it was a little bit better uh, th th than anything else. So, in any event, during 1941, 1942, uh, that is the two tremendous year uh, of the double Hitler invasion, first uh, against Moscow in 1941 and then in 1942, especially uh, of course, against Stalingrad and Leningrad, you know. So there was this tremendous battle. It seems that uh, we found out in uh, some Moscow archives that he was furiously reading a book, of which I will tell you what was this book. Now, the first void page of this book, it is full, you see, of, of uh, pen, uh, in ink, pen uh, uh, of his... Uh, notes and some of these notes are translated here it says nitroglycerin factory speak with the uh, shaposnikov clarify teacher teacher numbers etc etc so these were actually definitely his own personal writing so gleb went there and put many many disquettes all around this page and then we analyzed them by X-ray, and there we found out something very, very special that nobody ever knew. Lithium salts, levels of lithium, you see, uh, the, uh, by the way, this uh, lithium chloride, these are markers down here, of lithium chloride and lithium uh, uh, carbonate. Now, what does it mean? In those days, that's why, that's why did, did we, we sent, uh, this paper was published in Analy Analytical, Bioanalytical Chemistry, very recently, a few months ago. And the title was Stalin Black Dog, a post-mortem diagnosis. Why Black Dog? Black Dog, in a way, does not refer to Stalin. It refers to Winston Churchill. Everybody knew that Winston Churchill suffered uh, of depression already since 1915 on the disaster on the streets of the Dardanelli when the English uh, fleet was destroyed and he was kicked out uh, from the Admiralty. And he kept, he, he kept suffering all of his life of depression. And he called this depression, he called this black dog. But nobody knew that Stalin suffered. There are no records, no clinical records. That it was kept very, very secret. Yet we know that these levels of lithium are the typical levels that would be on the pages of somebody who had been cured. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, of depression and that uh, these levels in the saliva, sweat and so on. And so this is a world premiere. It, it was kept very, very secret. Why so? Because Stalin, if uh, already in 1922, he had had a, a very famous uh, um, uh, new neurophysician called the Bechterev. Bechterev diagnosed him and he said that this fellow was schizophrenic the day after he was, he disappeared. They fusillated him and destroyed his body. So people knew 
the, the physician knew that they, they, if they would open their mind, their mouth, that they would be killed. So nobody knows this stuff. So what was he reading? He was reading Ivan Grosny, which is Ivan the Terrible, is the story of Ivan the Terrible, who in the 1600 unified the entire, founded the Russian Empire. This book was written in 1907 by one of the three Tolstoys, you know, this, this was the younger one, Alexei Nikolaevich Tolstoy. He wrote it in 1937 and he dedicated it to Stalin, so Stalin knew that the story of Ivan the Terrible was meant to be, he was as good and as great of, uh, as, as Ivan the Terrible. And in fact, this book was so popular that then Sergei Mihailovich Eisenstein even, uh, even shot a movie, even the terrible, which I saw many, many years ago. It's a spectacular movie um, in any event. Um, and uh, it was shot in 1944 in honor of Stalin. And so here you see the book cover, the lithium, and on the left, uh, on the right side, the face of Stalin. So prior to finishing the story, I want to tell you the latest, latest paper that we published is a paper on finally, you know, all the EVA uh, technology has been used only, if you like it, for documents which are very recent, maybe 100, 150 years old, or a few hundred years old, like in the case of the plague, but nothing very, very old. Now we went to investigate an Egyptian mummy in the Egyptian Museum in Turin, which I invite you to see, if you see, after the Cairo Egyptian Museum, this is the best of the world. It is a fantastic. So this, this uh, 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 mummy is very, very old. It's from Gebelein in Egypt and is dated between 2400 to 2200 before Christ. So this mummy is about 4,500 4, years old. So you see here, down here on the left, we, we applied the Eva technique to the skin, here to the dry skin, then we looted and we analyzed that this is the partial list of identified human proteins. And there, as you can see, we found plenty of collagen, alpha-2, alpha-1, alpha-1-1, alpha-1-2, alpha-1-3, keratins, keratins, and so on. So we found plenty of collagen, many, many types of collagens and keratins still present there. So, so we think now that we can span, you know, from, in fact, now we are analyzing Mammoth tissues from a, a region of Siberian region. This mammoth is 40,000 years old. So we are now, you know, going back, back, back in history. So I showed you just, a, you know, a, a small view of our activities. And now I want to finish, however, prior to leaving the story of the mummies, boys who seem to be interested in mummies. And it is very cute, I found this story. In 1924, Giacomo Leopardi, who is a very famous Italian poet, I'm, I'm sure you have heard about him, he composed a dialogue between Frederick Ruish and Mummies, in which this Dutch physician Ruish, due to a peculiar cosmic cycle, was enabled to talk to, to have an intense dialogue with the Mummies that were preserved in his lab. As a, as a result of it, there was a choir, <laughs> there ensued a chanson, you know, a song, of choir of the dead people, uh, uh, even just like in Mexican, <laughs> or matters of life and death. But let me tell you, I was very curious about that, so I tried to interrogate our, our mommy and talk to our girl with the pitted dress, but there was no answer, and neither from her, and there was no so that we, we figured out that perhaps it was not, we didn't get in resonance with the correct cosmic cycle. So maybe we would have to wait some, some billions of years before getting to talk to our mom. So I want to finish that by presenting to you here on the left is the Plana and Gleb. You see them in front of the famous, uh, you know, state archives in Milano, you know, the ones in which we did all this intense, intense investigation of the plague. And here is Alfonsina D'Amato, who has been interviewed by Italian TV, you know, Channel 3 and Channel 5, uh, 
prevent. Alforsina D'Amato was the one who did all the mass spectrometry, and we were very lucky because she had a, a fusion orbiter. So she did top, top work, not because she had the top machine, but because she is a top guy in Proteon. So this is it. And I want to thank Sherlock Holmes for having given us this idea and thank all of you people for being so patient to, to listen to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I finished. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor. It was a, a breathtaking talk. Actually, you, you guided us towards several countries and towards several period of the history. So it was really, really amazing. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, I can just already tell you that we had more or less 100 people watching at this until now. And, but I'm sure that uh, everyone will share this talk that is on YouTube with their peers and colleagues. So to, to spread even more this talk. Yeah, and please, I would like to grab Zilberstein and Svetla, Svetlana to talk to you people so that you meet them. Grab and Svetlana, can you, can you present yourself? and say a few words. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much for great uh, talk, Professor Rigetti, and uh, thank you for Giuseppe, Tiago, and uh, Professor Dumont uh, for this opportunity. And uh, we will be happy to explore in Brazil uh, a few projects. One of the projects, for example, uh, um, revisit of uh, death cows of uh, famous Austrian writer Stephen Zweig, who died in 40, 1942 in uh, Petropolis. And it uh, will be very interesting to investigate uh, his uh, last papers and uh, other things because uh, he made suicide by barbiturates and uh, who knows what happened at the period of Second World War. I think it will be a great uh, project if we will be reinvestigating Stefan Zweig suicide uh, case. This uh, my my dream. Mm -hmm. okay. Great, great. Excellent idea, Greg. And I'm sure that our Brazilian uh, colleagues will take it up and we will start a collaboration. Is that so, Giuseppe? For sure, for sure. For sure, it will be a great opportunity to expand these tools also for uh, to reveal some uh, secrets hidden in the Brazilian history. Great. Um, there are a few questions, so I have a few questions also, but I would like to, to, to ask some question here from the chat. I don't know if Thiago can put on uh, screen. Yes, so Thiago actually asked, uh, he, he thanks a lot for the inspiring talk. And they want to know if you ever found poison traces in middle age books. I think he has uh, this idea because uh, is inspired by the movie The Name of the Rose. Ah. So what, what the real people use to to put poison in the page to avoid people reading them, as it was considered heresy. Uh, it's very interesting. This this movie was inspired from the book uh, Nome de la Rosa by. Right, right. Yes, yes. This is great. Actually, you are right. I believe that Umberto Eco, when he wrote this book, he also. Uh, reveal the mystery that uh, you know the monks uh, had their fingers uh, contaminated by antimonium and, you know uh, uh, antimonium is a poison so maybe by you know licking their their uh, their fingers with uh, you know with the tongue they kept uh, little by little uh, you know poison in themselves but surely this is a very interesting I don't think we ever we have not done anything so far, but surely looking for traces of antimonium or also arsenic and so on, the Middle Ages book would be an excellent idea. By the way, you know the origin of the of the name antimonium, it comes from uh, uh, from Latin, it means anti-monk, because monks used to be killed by this, uh, by this matter. So so it, it, it took the nickname of antimonium, which means against the monks. Yes. <laughs> it was yeah. a monk a killer. Very, very good. Maybe Gleb wants to uh, Gleb wants to comment on that. Uh, 
And there are other things which will be extremely interesting, I guess, uh, uh, will be make some ethnogra ethnogra ethnographical investigation because uh, uh, people use uh, uh, usually natural dyes, natural binders, natural materials for different things and uh, make analysis of uh, the thing in uh, Brazil will be extremely interesting because uh, we, uh, because definitely uh, many things uh, in uh, uh, Brazil, it's uh, very unique and uh, uh, would be interesting to make molecular, molecular portrait and molecular characterization of uh, all uh, ethnographical things in your country. Yes. So there is another question from Magno. Uh, he said, uh, thanks again. Have you ever tried to analyze ceramics content from archaeological sites? Ah, this is an excellent question. <laughs> I think Gleb <laughs> can comment on that because we have a paper that is in the right in a Gleb has a fantastic story. Can you tell the story, Gleb? <laughs> yeah, we make uh, analysis of uh, uh, pottery uh, from uh, crusaders and uh, from uh, Muslims, uh, Muslim uh, uh, warriors from Saladin because we fought in the Pandemic period, I spent a lot of time. We spent a, we spent a lot of time in some spot where it was a famous uh, battle between Richard Lionheart and uh, Saladin. And uh, we tried to reconstruct why, uh, what kind of food eat uh, both uh, sides in the uh, crusaders and the uh, Muslim uh, warriors. And uh, this interesting thing. And the other thing is, uh, uh, of course, the ceramic is very uh, good uh, uh, storage, uh, create good storage conditions for proteins and for other biomolecules because uh, it's a very poor structure and uh, give a good opportunity to preserve for long period uh, different uh, traces from milk, uh, milk and other natural things. Well, Greg uh, uh, does, does not want to reveal the story, but I can tell you a bit more. It turns out, can I, Greg? It turns out that uh, in the pottery of the Crusaders, we found, we found especially also pork meat. And obviously, the Muslims would never eat pork. <laughs> so that's the story. But the story is fantastic. I can tell you the title of the manuscript, which uh, still nobody knows, uh, because I've, uh, I've thought of it today, even Gleb doesn't know. The title is the following, Richard Lionheart, Lionheart and uh, the, uh, the Ferocious Saladin face to face in Arsu, semicolon, a proteomic study. Why face to face in Arsu? Because it was the battle of Arsu that was the the divider. It was the first time in which the Saladin had a big, big def was defeated by Richard Lionheart, and it was his downhill. You know, it was. And now, why in Arsu is the place in which this tremendous battle took place? Took place, and it's only ten kilometers away from where. There is a, a, the, ruin, the ruins of a castle there uh, where Gleb lives. So Gleb could go there like an archaeologist and, uh, and do the digging. <laughs> Very great story. Great story. We have to publish this paper before the end of the year. You know. <laughs> great story. It is uh, a, amazing, an amazing story. You can see. Uh, that actually many people are commenting amazing talks so i will not go one by one but i mean it, i mean there are many people saying that and uh, really thanking you for for this talk so i have a i have a question actually the first one professor get is regarding the kepler alchemy story that you show and actually kepler he was uh, an assistant of tico Brahe. When uh, actually, uh, when Tycho Brahe was exiliated, and then he went to to Prague. So, 
would it be good also to analyze some uh, manuscript of Tycho Brahe to see actually if this alchemist was not only done by Kepler, but also by Tycho Brahe? Good point you have there. In fact, I didn't mention it, but it is true. You know, when Tycho Brahe moved from, uh, uh, from uh, Copenhagen to, uh, you know, to Prague, Prague. Uh, in Copenhagen he had a tower, you know, for making astronomical observations in an island. And at the bottom, in the cellar of the tower, he had 10 furnaces for doing, he was doing massive alchemy. He was a fanatic of alchemy. Whereas, you know, Kepler was a great mathematician. So we believe that when Kepler was called by Tycho Brahe in 1600 in, uh, in Prague, and they lived together 11 years, then Tycho Brahe died. Possibly uh, Tycho Brahe con uh, was contagious. He gave his disease, he transmitted his disease to, to uh, you know, to Kepler, and that's why Kepler started it. Then mm. maybe he abandoned it. But surely, we believe, we strongly believe that there is this... Uh, uh, ah, here there is a question by Gilbert. Hey, uh, to, to Vlad, how do you, do you refer to Stefan Zweig? Is that so? Greg, are you are you are you reading this? Yeah, yeah. The, yes, I referred to Stefan Zweig about who uh, check uh, his uh, personal papers and uh, last papers to uh, check uh, again uh, official diagnosis about suicide by barbiturates because uh, maybe we will find something new and uh, maybe we will revisit. Uh, maybe uh, because uh, it was very strange if well, Sveik, Stefan Sveik, at, uh, in Petropolis, in Brazil, at uh, 1942. I think uh, now you, Brazilian friends, you should dig out his manuscripts, and then we can send you to the sketch to investigate. Yeah, last uh, pre-death notes, two pre-suicide notes, because okay. uh, he Rob, wrote Rob, a yes. A lot. Uh, it's not the last letters to uh, government and uh, to friends and that's a thing. But it still was a very strange uh, suicide. And, good, and, good idea. Excellent. That good idea. Also, I would like to repeat about ethnograph ethnographical things uh, in Brazil because uh, uh, Indians and, uh, uh, and the colonists, uh, all these. Uh, People provide natural uh, binders, glues, and uh, building materials, dyes, etc. I think that everything should be uh, investigated by modern analytical methods and tools to record uh, history because uh, most of uh, recipes it's uh, just from uh, uh, you know from historical records, but without any proof that uh, where some specific materials. That's a very good idea. Maybe I can, I can now tell another secret that nobody knows because I received just now, a few hours ago, the results. We have been investigating the ink used by Alessandro Volta, you know, the very famous inventor of the fire, you know, the pillar, the one who illuminated the world. Einstein too said, that, you know, without, uh, without Alessandro Volta, we would still be in the dark. Now, Alessandro Volta, nobody knows that. We, we analyze the scripts, original scripts, written in 1796, before he met Napoleon in, in, 19, in, 18, uh, in 1801. Napoleon called him to Paris and he gave him a gold medal. You know, for the now, nobody knew. Now, this ink he made probably ink by himself, by grinding different plants and roots and so on. And now, today I know, you know what we found in this ink, just by putting into this case and the root, we found more than 2,000, we have identified more than 2,000 organic chemicals belonging to plants and vegetable extracts, including, of course, the rubia, you know, the root, uh, the red root of the uh, root and so on. It is amazing. So, you know, if we investigate this, uh, 
this uh, these paintings or whatever done uh, by Brazilians, by the Indians and so on, we can detect anything, anything, anything that plants, uh, roots, uh, vegetables, everything, everything. Imagine if we found 2,000 organic chemicals. Nobody had expected that. There is a, another question from Carlos Ricard, and he said, Professor, if in your opinion, how long can we go back in history to do this uh, study looking for uh, Sherlock Holmes proteomics? Well, as I told you, you know, we are now investigating together with friends in Catania, the intestine and the uh, different tissues of mammoths that are 40,000 years old. So at least we can go back as old as that. But basically, you know, proteins are much more resistant to to degradation than DNA. So in principle, we could investigate proteins that are millions of years. Mm -hmm. We even tried, remember, Gleb, we even tried to analyze uh, proteins of insects embedded into this uh, resin, you know, into this, uh, how is it called, amber, you know, in amber. The problem is that we crush this amber, you know, um, and these are 20 million years old. We crush this amber and we extracted the protein, but you know what happens? Most of the proteins have been cross-linked during the process of amber polymerization. Uh, proteins are cross-linked as well. And solubilizing the proteins is very, very difficult. But in principle, they are still there. They are millions, 20 million years old. If we could find a proper way to solubilize them, we could analyze them. Uh, I have actually a few questions. If I may, uh, one is a technical on these uh, Eva diskettes that uh, you produced. In some of the manuscripts you publish, I have seen that you use a specific proportion of strong cation, strong anion, C18 and C8. I mean, this combination that you make is to capture different kind of molecules at once so you can uh, release them with the different elution solvents and so on? Yes, it's correct. You know, if you have a, a mixture like that, you basically capture proteins by all the types of so-called non-covalent bondings. And the, so non-covalent bondings are ion-to-ion -ion interaction, which is the strongest one. Then hydrogen bond, which is uh, hydrogen bonds is like a jolly, it's everywhere. The hydrogen yes. bond is it, uh, also involved in the ion interaction. And then hydrophobic interaction. We capture them by hydrophobic interaction, ion to ion, both positive and negative. And hydrogen bonds, we capture any possible material, organic material, via non covalent interaction. This is universal. But now I could tell you another secret that we didn't tell you. But I hope I can. Can I? We, you know, for instance, in the uh, uh, inks by Alessandro Volta, we used a new generation of these cats, which is enormously more powerful. Can I tell it, or is it a secret? Greg? Can I tell the story? Of course, yes, of course. <laughs> so now we are using. We had this idea talking together. So Gleb has prepared just a month ago a new family of these cats, which contain, in addition to strong and and the town, C18, C18, it contains millions and millions of other different uh, 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 resins, which are the famous combinatorial peptide ligand hybrids. So now we have millions of different ways that can buy any any pet, any anything. <laughs> so these are uh, much what the book would call much really truly ecumenical. I was and, expecting that, Professor, as the natural <laughs> evolution of the evidence gets. So you know, I was just waiting for happening. But now that is why probably you know with this ecumenic piece we could detect more than two thousand organic chemicals into Volta wow. Sea. Volta you don't know. We had two different things. <laughs> Nobody knew. But if you read any papers published on the intercomposition of 
from the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls up to the present. Nobody knew that these vegetable rings could contain more than 2,000 different molecules and chemicals or chemicals. Nobody knew. I see. We, we were absolutely shocked and amazed. We said it can be true. Very and, and actually another maybe technical question I would like to ask is that, of course, in order to bind these uh, pep proteins, metabolites, you needed to wet these diskettes, right? Before putting on the... So when, when you wet them, of course, you need them to, to dry a little bit. Otherwise, when you put on the piece of paper, it will leave some kind of... Uh, uh, shade of is fundamental because if there is no traces of water, there is no ion to ion interaction. Yeah, you have ion to ion interaction, and for instance, even the combinatory peptidic So, you, you need to have water, yeah? but this is the trick. You know, Gleb had a smart idea when he had the idea of embedding this uh, strong banana and so into the Eva. Eva, ethylene vanilla acetate, is a plastic phony. This plastic, so when it gets polymerized, it is hydrophobic. So, no matter, you can leave them a week, a month, a year in, in water. They, the, the water is only absorbed by the strong and ionostrom cation exchanger, so it's an hydration water. It's only in the layer, in the yeah. layer of the rest. Once you block it, there is no water around. It cannot be because this is classified. But when you touch it, the humidity, the hydration water in the cation and ion exchanges in the combinatorial battery and so on, there will be enough to make a binding by all these possible uh, leakages that we said, you know, hydrogen, hydrogen, ion binding, and then of course you don't need water if you are the public interaction. But that is that, yes. Wetting them in water is fundamental, but there is no damage whatsoever because in reality there is no free water anywhere. The water which is there is strongly bound to the rays as an hydration shell, period. Great. There, there is another question. I don't know if, uh, yeah. So again, Magnum is asking how hard it is to get diagnostic peptides for species specific identification. For example, when you talk about mycobacterium, I think you have different species. And then you need the proteotypic peptide, I think, to identify. So he's asking how hard it is to get these specific peptides. Well, you know, in, in principle, when we identify the mycobacterium tuberculosis and so on, you do you you you, you take all your peptides, you put it in a database, and then by a metaproteomic approach, you try to get what the final answer. And of course, but you are right. If you don't have a prototypic peptide, you cannot say I have identified this or that. You have to have it. But now we can tell it, you know, now we are trying this new disk, which also contain uh, combinatorial peptide. Also on the human skin. For instance, you know, you could you could put on a patient suffering from psoriasis, we can put it on the normal skin versus the skin with the psoriasis area. And then do differential proteomics and see what, what what is the different signal you get. I mean, now with this combinatorial, I think we can do much better. You can do, uh, yeah. yeah, very great, great. So I don't. I think there are no other questions. So I would like to uh, first ask you if you want to say something. But uh, I would like before that actually showing uh, uh, one book. <laughs> ah, that's it. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. I don't know. If, I mean, uh, it, was uh, nice it was yes. immensely popular, but even more popular was the one, the previous one of conventional selective focus. Yeah. Conventional selective focus is sold the 10,000 copies, which for a scientific booklet is an <laughs> immobilized PS gradients only sold the 2,000 copies, but you know why? Because the poor, you know, the company that was producing, that was LKB producer, a small company in Stockholm, Sweden, was phagocytated by pharmacy, you know, this other mm -hmm. people. And when they phagocytated it, 
They hated the yeah, the NIH syndrome, you know, not invented here. So they destroyed. They did, they dismissed the production of immobilized pH gradient. So for years and years they ruined biochemical investigations because they refused to sell. It. Can you imagine? But you know how bastard the capitalism can be. <laughs> so actually, this book was a present from Professor Carlos Winter, which is actually uh, watching uh, live your presentation. Is also followed your. Uh, yeah, you know, these books uh, now they are not available any longer in print. Yeah, this and he gave only had two or three copies left over. You know. He gave to me actually as a as a present. And I can see the level of details and uh, uh, theory that is behind. Yes, it's, 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 really, it's, really it's really great. And actually, I will take the opportunity, starting from this book, and also imagining how hard it was to knock at the door of museum and get access to this uh, to these manuscripts, to these clothes. And I would like to take this opportunity and the second chapter of this book, where the title of the of the second chapter is Per Aspera Ad Astra. Uh -huh. Per Aspera Ad Astra actually means true hardship to the stars. Correct. Right. So do you think we can give this message to the students and uh, the people that are watching now? That, I mean, if you really want to reach the stars, you have to, to go per aspera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are fully right, I tell you. You know, all my life, I worked very, very hard to, to get there. I remember, you know, when I wrote these books, I remember we were visiting relatives, friends, and so on, and while my wife and my children were playing around, I was sitting in a corner writing furiously notes. <laughs> you, you can never stop, but then you have a tremendous happy life. If you believe in what you are doing, happiness will be your reward, no matter how hard it is. But now, listen, prior to leaving, I would like to say to Gleb, please, have uh, your wife, as Svetlana, saying hello to people. Is she around there? Having her talking to everybody? Yeah. Svetlana is not yeah. so Please, have Svetlana. <laughs> Great. We have to be on equal footing, you know, because Vetlana also did a lot of work. And yes. I would like to people to meet her. Ah, good, good. Ciao, Svetlana. Good night. Good to see you. <laughs> Hello. Good to see you. And I'm happy that another 100 Brazilians will, will see you. And, you know, Brazilians will be very fond of blonde ladies, so you will receive a lot of invitations to visit Brazil. Yeah, thank you for, for your lecture. Thank you. I was listening. Bye-bye. All right. So thanks a lot, uh, Gleb, Svetlana, and Professor Riget for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, in the name of all the organizing committee of the, of the My Friend is Massa, 2021, which is organized by the Brazilian Proteomic Society. So all the committee, organizing committee that is composed by Professor Gilberto Domon, Thiago, Fabio Nogueira, uh, Magno, Veronica, Luis, Anna Carolina, uh, Jessica and me. So we would like to thank you again for this wonderful talk and uh, I'm sure it will inspire not only for what you have uh, shown today, but also for the future to develop more and more projects. And who knows, we will apply this Sherlock Holmes proteomics also here in Brazil. Yes, I hope we will have uh, from now on good collaborations. Okay. Thanks with again. You, with friends and friends. Thank you, everybody. I think. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. 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 B